what are the, some of the benefits for businesses, right? You get access to very smart thought partners. Um, they have certain rigorous training and, and methods, um, which would be actually hard to hire quickly and economically in the marketplace. And they know a large uh, swath of the science and literature that already exists. Um, it's less risky than having to go out and hire someone. Uh, it can help with your credibility both with funders and customers to have a, a credible known academic involved. Um, one of the things about the academic process is that it actually takes a long time for whatever academics are working on to get into journals that the public would see, or the peer-reviewed journals. So by engaging with academics, you're often having access to research that's um, two or three years from the rest of the public and market knowing about. Um, you can help reduce your reputational risk if you have a, a, a qualified academic involved, and they can also help you um, think about social good. Most academics care quite a bit about social good. And what are the benefits of the academics? Um, the potential to do field work, you know, work in the real world versus lab work. Potential to do work that has a real world impact. Um, one of the things academics are often struggling with is end users or subjects to actually engage with real people. Um, and then if you're working with business, there's a lot more potential for scale, that your ideas will actually end up getting scaled. Companies, large companies, uh, already have scale. Um, if they don't have scale, then usually if the thing works that you've come up with, they're likely to move it forward. And, and um, well, you know, one of the things about business is it's attracting capital to, to grow and, and provide resources for scale. So let's talk about some challenges. Um, and I think at the heart of these challenges is that business and academics have different production functions at the end of the day. Right? So the production function for the academic is about, at the end of the day, um, producing knowledge, conducting research. And for a business, it's some combination of impact and money. And so I'm going to make some generalizations about academics and business that I want to be clear are not, are not true of all academics all the time. Um, but I think this is a helpful framework to think about um, where these, how these challenges are, are really uh, created. Um, so one of the first things has to do with testing. Right? So academics, um, because they're trying to produce knowledge and often ultimately papers, they really want to do rigorous testing and evaluation related to what they're, they're doing. In the business world, there's first the question of like, how much do I want to test at all? Um, I can't tell you the number of times where people have just said to us and academic partners, well, just tell us what to do and we'll just put it out there in the marketplace and we're fine with the before and after um, versus any sort of rigorous test like a randomized control test. Um, but then there's also this complexity around if they do agree to test, um, this idea of uncovering mechanisms versus impact. Right, so the classic way that this plays out, it's less true in the technology world, but often in the field, you don't have unlimited N. You can't run unlimited numbers of treatments and controls. You often have maybe one or two treatments at the most in a control group. Now in the tech space, this is changing because you often have lots of opportunity to run different variations. But in cases where you don't, the academic is often saying, well, I want to limit the number of things I put into the intervention or the innovation because I actually want to figure out what the mechanism is that's going on um, because I'm about creating foundational knowledge. Whereas the, the business will say, well, I want to do the thing that's going to have the most impact. And therefore, that would involve putting a number of different elements into the innovation. And then at the end of the day, you might not know which of the things ha had the impact. Um, Another conflict is this desire of whether the information is going to be public or not, right? So researchers want to publish their findings. Businesses um, often are looking for competitive advantage that they would like to keep private. Uh, a third thing is the time frame for results. So um, academics often are willing to take more time to find some interesting insight, whereas businesses are they're on a timeline, they have earnings they're trying to make, so they're really much more interested in a, a shorter time frame. Not always, but often. Um, the, and maybe the most critical one is this issue of um, solving a problem versus answering a research question. Right? So the academic um, is really trying to, they're doing research in some area. 
the, you know, the, if you wanted to take a more stylized example, an academic has a particular area that they're focused on. Say they're a psychologist and they're studying identity. If you go to them with some problem that you're having, lo and behold, the solution they come up with has to do with, can I test something related to identity as part of a solution for your problem? Versus the business wants the problem solved and would like the kind of best solution. Now, again, that's not always exactly the case. A academics often have flexibility around what they're studying. But it is this question of, of solving the problem versus answering a research question. Um, and then lastly, uh, academics often have lots of irons in the fire, right? They're out there talking to lots of different possibilities of, of how, the, how they can conduct their research. And um, there have been situations where uh, they're talking to somebody, the company started to get excited, but some other iron gets hotter, and then they're focused on that, um, that idea and that issue, and, and the, the business can feel, uh, in essence, kind of ghosted. Like, where's the academic I thought I was working on something with? Um, and so there's, I think the key thing here is to understand that there's underlying incentives that people have and context in which they're operating. And I think that's the most helpful part of the framework. It's not that you may say, like, well, why the hell is that person doing that? Why is the academic doing that? Or why does the business want that? But underlying it is that the, there's this different set of production functions. And what we found, this is just one solution, but if, to the degree you can be open and upfront about the needs and objectives of each party um, and, under, and uh, understand the underlying incentives at the beginning before you're even talking about the specifics of the project, you then have a, a good sense of, okay, well, this is what the academic needs, and the academic has a good sense of this is what the business is trying to get out of it. And then you can hopefully get both of those needs met in the process. The academic can get their, uh, the research done and, and often a, a paper published what they want, and the business can get um, impact and, and something that's helpful for them. Uh, so I, that's the first kind of takeaway. And again, it's not about have I said the exact right things about uh, how academics behave or how businesses behave, but thinking about this framework of what the underlying incentives are. Okay. The second thing is that finding win-wins can be hard. Um, you know, there's lots of different fields which Ideas42 works in, and some fields it seems like they're easier to find win-wins. You take the financial services sector, historically that's been a pretty extractive industry. Um, and so, finding situations that are making the customer better off and the financial institution better off in the time frame that the financial institution cares about, which is often a um, pretty short time frame, a couple years, can be challenging. Healthcare is an, an area where we're finding a lot of promise, where there's lots of win-wins, where the patient's better off, the, uh, the insurer's better off, and the provider's better off. Um, so just being aware that finding those win-wins, it, it can be challenging, and you have to really talk through and, and look for them um, consistently. The other thing is just a reminder, I mean, Hunt touched on this, is that, is that the you know, business tech and academia isn't gonna solve all the problems. And I would just talk through one little example, again, related to the financial services industry. This is just an illustrative chart of a segmentation of people that the financial industry serves, right? So the people all the way to the right are many of the people in this room where they have income surplus consistently uh, and they have plenty of income and then there's products for them that help them manage their money and maximize their return. In the middle category um, is an area that there's been a lot of excitement around FinTech, right, which is this timing of your cash flows. And there's people who are both, uh, they, on the right here middle is mismatch cash flows, right? So people who have enough money, but the timing is way off. Um, and this might be something like even, even would be uh, trying to address this. And then people on the margin who might be slightly in the red, um, but they also have mismatched cash flows. And there are products that could uh, help them both to maybe spend a little bit less or earn a little bit more to get into the black, but also manage the timing of the cash flows. But there's a whole set of people in the market that just have persistent shortfalls. And the idea that financial products are going to help deeply poor people solve the problem of poverty, I think, is a, is a massive misnomer, right? So um, just realizing what problems you can tackle, this requires some other 
solution, which often government has to be involved in, right? So we, we can't forget that um, government is often part of, needs to be part of the solution, uh, either because there's some system change required um, or that there's regulation and rules that are required to make fair playing field, or there's actually a need for income and uh, wealth redistribution. Um, so we have to think about how we, where possible, have government as the, the third um, uh, part in the wheel. Okay, so a couple just examples. Um, one example we've been playing around with is the venture studio model, where we create the businesses ourselves, and we're often partnered with academics. Um, the first example of this is Todd Rogers is here somewhere. There's Todd. Um, in class today, which was a, a business that Todd created around addressing chronic absenteeism based on his, his research. Um, and the nice thing about the venture studio model is you can continue to be engaged with uh, the academics. They can be very involved in the, the process but not, and use the skills that they have, um, which is not typically running the business on a day-to-day, -day, but continuing to add value as you refine your interventions and you get more data uh, around the testing. So in class today is now in multiple school districts and um, we'll have about $5 million in revenue in the coming year. Nichols is a student loan, addressing the student loan crisis using behavioral science and Virgil is around reducing recidivism um, and helping former incarcerated people reintegrate into society. All of these are things where there's win-wins, right? There's somebody who's willing to pay for the the benefit of what's being produced and, and there's some social benefit. It's not always the person who's benefiting, in this case the, the, the former incarcerated person who's paying, it's the state that's saving the difference between keeping the person in jail, $40,000 a year, and having them on some monitoring service, three to $5,000 a year. Okay, um, next example is around Mexican retirement savings that we worked on. Uh, in Mexico, the retirement savings system is interesting because there's a, uh, a governmental entity that regulates it, but all the re individual retirement accounts are, like our 401ks, held in a, by um, individual companies. Um, you know, there's, problem, there's an obvious problem that the people aren't saving enough. There's a mandatory savings rate, which is, is not enough. And so how do you get people to do more voluntary contribution? There's behavioral barriers um, around uh, uh, you know, retirement feels far off into the future. There's uncertainty about uh, the future and that discourages action. There's no visible cues that make you think about retirement. Um, and so how do you make it more salient and visual? And, and I love this example because it built on lab research that had been done already, which was there's been lab research done where people, if you take a picture of somebody and then show them an age picture, they say they're more likely to then save for retirement but we didn't actually know for certain whether they would save for retirement. Um, so working with one of the providers, we, um, they got SMS and emails, text um, to, to opt into this app and take a picture of themselves. They were then showed an age picture of themselves and then had the opportunity to go directly to accounts. Um, these are the open rates um, that occurred. I think the most, there were different messages that were tried um, but the most compelling thing is that the percentage of one-time contributions as a result of this uh, goes up um, 13 percent. Uh, uh, now it's not a huge, when you actually think about the numbers, it's only a, you know, a 0.2 percentage point change. Um, but at the scale that we're talking about, it actually has a pretty significant impact, right? So if you roll this out, in aggregate, you get about $550,000 more in savings for spending about $4,000. Um, and this is just the one time. You can imagine this goes um, on and on. Uh, another project we're working around, environmental sustainable banking. So the question we're really trying to answer here, and we don't have results yet on this one, is will customers change banks because of banks' sustainability practices, both how they operate as a bank internally, but also what they're investing in. Are they investing in the fossil fuel industry or, or regenerative green industries? Um, and you know, developing these insights of what are the behavioral barriers that, that are um, causing people to, to not switch or how, how their choice, choices are being made. Um, I won't go into all the details of this, but this is an interesting one because 
there's a funder, but then there's a number of financial institutions, credit union, bank, fintech, um, that are all involved. We're working with them together, talking to their customers, and then eventually we're going to try out innovations with them to, to get people to, to switch. And then lastly, you know, I tried to have a smattering of um, different types of businesses. This one is with Capital One. Um, Capital One, like many banks, spend a bunch of money and resources on financial education. This is the work by John List, uh, or not John, sorry, John Lynch, um, and others that basically shows financial education doesn't work for the most part. Um, and, you know, why is that? Uh, there's a variety of reasons what, of what's driving that. Um, concepts are not top of mind. Um, cost, cost of switching to new behaviors can be high. The, the training is often hard to apply to everyday life. Um, and so can we create a different type of education that really is focused on clients learn, but this is really a set of heuristics and simple decisions, and then they set goals, but then are immediately driven to being take, taking actions around what those goals are, um, and ultimately having improved financial health. So we're in the process of designing this with them, and then we'll, uh, we'll test it out. Um, so that's, that's what I have, the, those examples. Um, but I think the key takeaway for me, again, is thinking about what are the incentives um, for the different parties and making sure that you talk about those incentives and motivations up front will ultimately end up in uh, greater, more successful partnerships later on. Thank you.